CGN TV. It's not just that you're tempted. God promises you don't have to cave in, but you've tried and failed and tried and failed and tried and failed and tried and failed. Willpower won't work. He says, there isn't a temptation, and the lies are, this is just mine, it's unique, it's my family background, it's the way I'm wired, I can't help myself. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Not true. There is faithfulness that can allow you to break free from that. But even when you blow it, when you sin, here's God's faithfulness. If you confess your sin, 1 John 1, 9, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sin, and not just that, but to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And so, in our final session together, it's going to be a bit more devotional, but I want to talk more about when and how to experience God's faithfulness and review some of all the attributes. Because I like to be logical, I wanted to give them to you. Observation number one is all of us depend on something or someone to hold us up inside. We all do. For some, it's your mate or a relationship, a job. For some, it's how you look or how much money you make or uh, how successful your kids are. But we all have something or someone, can be money, can be fame, that hold us up inside. Then what we know is when that something or someone is coming through for us, we have a sense of satisfaction and optimism and things are going well. When that something or someone doesn't come through for us, we have anxiety. We have no peace, we have fear, and often despair. And all I want you to know is that there is no one and there is nothing that can come through for you 100% of the time except the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you put your hope in a job or in a mate or in kids or in money or how you look or whatever it is, I mean, you're a blink away from that completely changing. And so your life goes up and down with circumstances and relationships. And so the key or the secret to life is to find someone who will come through for you 100% of the time in any and every circumstance. And I just want to tell you, the real God, his faithfulness is, that's what he'll do. His mercies are new. His loyal love for you. In the midst of your hurt, your pain, your weakness, your sin, your failure, if you would, out of this study, say, I'm going to pursue, I want to make knowing God the most important thing. I want to get close to Christ. I want my life to revolve around what his word says. I want to be wise and do life his way. I will tell you, there is a friend with supernatural power who is fully God and fully man, who rose from the dead, who will never, ever let you down. Let's define faithfulness so we're all on the same page. Dictionary says it's steadfast in affection. I like that. Steadfast in affection. He's in love with you. Allegiance, loyalty. When we say God is faithful, we mean he's dependable, trustworthy, staunch, resolute, constant, reliable, true to one's word, keeps his promises, always comes through. And then you ask yourself, well, how can God be faithful all the time? And it kind of allows us to do something that's really important, because if you're not careful, you can think of, okay, we talked about his holiness, and we've talked about his love, and we've talked about his justice, but those things operate all together in unity, simultaneously in harmony with one another. God can come through for you and me 100% of the time, because he's all-powerful. He never encounters anything that can thwart his plan or his purpose. He can come through because he's holy. He's pure. He's full of integrity. He's unable to lie. He's absolutely unapproachable light. He always does the right thing. He can come through because he's eternal. He's not affected by space or time. He sees the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. He can come through because he's omnipresent. Nothing can ever happen outside the sphere of his influence. And finally, he can come through for you because he's immutable. He never changes. He's consistent. God never has a bad day. You never go to him and pray and he goes, you know, maybe later. I'm, I'm having a really rough day. He's love, his justice, his kindness, his compassion 100% of the time. 
A.W. Tozer writes in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, all of God's acts are consistent with all of his attributes. This is one of those sentences that it's so profound it hurts my head. No attribute contradicts any other, but all harmonize and blend into each other in the infinite abyss of the Godhead. I mean, the infinite abyss of the God. I mean, can you, his love, his majesty, his power, his goodness, his holiness, in the infinite abyss, this God who spoke and galaxies, billions of them come into existence, and yet says to you and me, I want to be your friend, and I will never, ever leave you, and I'll never let you down, and anything that I have ever said, any promise I've ever made, I will guarantee, based on my character and my track record, that I'll be with you. It's absolutely amazing. So what I want to do in our time is talk a little bit about intellectually and biblically, well, how has God revealed that? But I want to spend the great majority of our time on how that faithfulness impacts the deepest struggles and challenges of our life. So let's talk about how has he revealed his faithfulness first by creation. Psalm 119, 89 and 90 says, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues throughout all generations. You establish the earth and it stands. Uh, my dad was a science teacher, and I had many majors in college, and science was one of them. And I liked the physical sciences, and you know, you learn about the planets, and you realize this, this planet of ours is going around the sun. I mean, I think it's like 24, 25,000 miles an hour. It's crazy. And, and we're spinning around very fast, and yet year after year, thousands of years after thousands of years, we go around the sun within a fraction of a few seconds exactly the same, exactly the same. When, when our atomic submarines, because of the magne uh, magnetic pools of the earth, want to come up and they've got those really powerful rockets inside of them and they can't be off, they have to surface every 90 days and they put up an antenna and what do they do? Lock onto the North Star because the North Star is more accurate. God, we call it science because what we have learned is these things are predictable. They're the same. And so we say, oh, that's mother nature. That's the first or second law of thermodynamics. And we observe all this consistency. And God would say, well, you can observe it. But it's there and it's consistent because I hold it together by the word of my power. I am the creator and the sustainer of all life. Second, it's through people. God shows his faithfulness through, he made promises to Abraham and the patriarchs. A Abraham, he said, I'm going to make you a great nation. Now, can you imagine this one little nomad guy running around in a tent 4,000 plus years later, the nation of Israel, it's endured. Can, he, Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell can't prevent against it. And so you got 12 little followers and, and one betrays you. And you start this big movement with 120 people and you're going to change the world? You, you never travel 40, 50 miles beyond where you were born and you're living in a world where there's two billion followers of Christ and law and culture and all of history is defined by the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. He, if we had time, I could pass microphones around and you could tell me about how he's been faithful to you. I could tell you of time when I prayed for one of my sons in the ICU just before he went into surgery and God healed him. I could tell you about times in, in my marriage when I thought there's no way this isn't going to work and crying out to God and the light's coming on. God's faithful to his people. Third, he's faithful by virtue of his character. I mean, if you want to know what the father's like, the son is like, the, the scripture is absolutely clear. The Old Testament picture of God the father, classic verse Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie, or the son of man that he should repent or change his mind. Has he spoken and will he not do it, or has he said it and will he not bring it to pass? In other words, God is always consistent and faithful. If he speaks, if he promises, 100%, he does it. Uh, the Spirit, we talk about the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, faithfulness, self-control. The, the character, the Holy Spirit develops faithfulness because it's the very character, it's the fruit of God the Spirit. Or, or Jesus, 
You could read the entire New Testament and you get to the end and he came as the savior, but the whole book of Revelation, the theme is he's going to come back and judge righteously. He's gonna make things right. And at the very end of history, we have the conqueror, the righteous judge on a white horse and he has a robe and on his robe has two words and on his thigh, you ready for the words? Faithful and true. He could have chosen any words. He wants you to know you can depend on me. And finally, I don't know about you, but uh, I did not grow up ever reading the Bible. I didn't understand it. But his word is true. You can depend on the promises in Scripture. On the last night, Jesus prayed in John 17, Father, sanctify them or set them apart or make them holy. These followers now and followers in the future, make them holy by your truth. Your word is truth. In Deuteronomy, it says, God keeps or is faithful to the covenants that he makes with us to a thousand generations. In Hebrews, it says, let us not sway or swerve or fall away for he who promised is faithful to us. And then we have in Christ's first coming hundreds of very specific predictions. I mean, 700 years before Christ was born, he'll be born Bethlehem of a virgin. This is what will happen. I mean, hundreds of specific prophecies, all for you to say and to learn. God's faithful to his word. So that's the intellectual, biblical basis for trusting God's faithfulness. What I want to do now is talk about when it really matters. I mean, I've got to have that because I'm not going to throw my brains in the trash. But the fact of the matter, the final one I think is most important to, to digest and to apply God shows us his faithfulness in the way that he shapes our life, the way he intervenes in our life when we're weak, when we're tempted, when we sin, and when we utterly, utterly fail. The apostle Paul was having a conversation with God in a moment of weakness. He had some physical issue that God allowed him to have, a thorn in his flesh, he called it. Some people think malaria, some people think an eye disease. Personally, I think it was a bad back. Uh, <laughs> constant pain. And God speaks to Paul. After Paul asks, God says no. Paul asks, God says no. Third time, God says, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I'll rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. And then look at this crazy application. Therefore, I am well content. Literally, the word is, I will delight in. It's a choice. With weaknesses, plural. With insults, plural. With distresses, plural. With persecutions and difficulties. Why? For Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. What, what you need to know is this is a testimony not of a family or of a marriage or of a man. This is the testimony of struggling people that didn't know anything. God was faithful in our weakness. In my weakness, I wanted to bail out of my marriage. In my weakness, I wanted to like knock one of my kids' heads off because he made me so crazy. In, in my weakness, as I struggled with, with lust, I, there wasn't even the internet back then. Praise God. <laughs> Praise God. But there were four girls to every guy. And I struggled and struggled and struggled. In my, in my weakness, God met me. See, when, when we're weak, we tend to run and we want a silver bullet or we'll find that person or we go eat or we open the refrigerator and, and, and put something into us that we know is not good for us. In our weakness, we try and fill the holes. And, and here's the deal. God is faithful. If in your weakness, rather than running to shopping or to work or to prescription drugs, or to focusing on your kids, or focusing on your work defining who you're going to be. In your weakness, say, God, here's his promise. I'll sustain you. My power is perfected in weakness. And and your prayers are, I can't do this. I remember a little rhyme that my wife learned from some lady. It goes something like, when you say, I can't do this, God says, I never said you could. And then he says, but by my strength, I promise you always can. And God wants to meet you in your weakness. He wants to shape you. He wants to change you. Your character gets changed in weakness. God wants you in your weakness to know, 
I'll be faithful, don't bail out. Don't take a cheap substitute. In your weakness, that's when I'll draw you near. Second is when you're tempted. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 13 says, no temptation is overtaking you, but as such is common to man. So anything that you're tempted in, everyone else has had it as well. Now notice this phrase, God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape that you might be able to endure it. Two little points I wanna make. You must understand the difference between temptation and sin. I, I meet people who don't understand that and they live with shame and guilt over things that are just normal. In other words, if you're a guy, excuse me ladies, but if you're a guy and an extremely attractive woman walks by with very little on and you look at her and you, oh, I can't believe I looked at her. If you're not a guy, you, there's a reason. You're designed to be attracted to that. Now what you do with the second look and your thoughts now, that's where sin comes in. But to be attracted and feel like, oh, I've sinned because, wow, any more than if you were a woman and you go to someone's house and they've just remodeled their kitchen and they've re-landscaped the backyard <laughs> and you are tempted to be envious, right? You're just, it's just, there's a thought like, oh my, oh my. You haven't sinned, you're tempted. Okay, let me, let me put it, okay, I want you to take, here's a little shelf right here, okay? This is all make-believe, make I'm making this up so I get to make up whatever I want. I want you to imagine that God has said to you, and, and a lot of you don't need this, but probably some of us do, is that you, just, it's not God's will for everyone, but you are to be on a very strict diet, no chocolate. And here's a piece of chocolate cake. I mean, it's, I mean, it's like unbelievable, decadent, wicked chocolate. And... And so you happen to be in Costco. <laughs> Temptation. Oh, I want that chocolate. I want that chocolate. Are you giving out samples? Yes, would you like one? You're just tempted. You love chocolate. It's, it's a besetting sin. You can't live without chocolate. No, no. Then you come down another aisle. <laughs> right? Okay? You're tempted. You haven't sinned. It just means there's something that attracts you to make you want to do something that in this particular case, you know for sure is not God's will. It won't be good for you. Now, sin has just occurred. Now, I use chocolate cake because it's very benign. For some in this room, you're besetting sin is not chocolate, it's pornography. And you look for times to privately log on. For some of you, you have an eating disorder and you hide it. For others, it's shopping. And every time you feel a little blue, you're tempted to go spend money you don't have and charge things. And by the way, every besetting sin is always covered by something called lying. And that's what, that's what the, the, the bigger thing that happens. Then pretty soon, this discrepancy, because when we do things we know are wrong, then these facades and lies come up. For others, it's actually work. And then the denial is, I'm doing it for my family. I need to work 85 hours. As you hear your mate say, we don't see you. And the kids wonder, what's going on? And, but all of us, let me ask you, what's your piece of chocolate cake look like? What do you struggle with? For some, it's their body. You, you know, some guys, it's like really cold outside and they got a muscle shirt. Well, why? Well, if you're gonna work that hard, you wanna show it off. For others, it's their youth, their sex appeal. And the one surgery leads to another surgery, it leads to another surgery because somehow your identity is so wrapped up if you're not still beautiful. But you know, 40s, you can hang in there, 50s, it gets harder, 60s, it's pretty tough. The lie is, and this is throughout the church, is not just that you're tempted. God promises you don't have to cave in, but you've tried and failed and tried and failed and tried and failed and tried and failed. Willpower won't work. 
He says, there isn't a temptation, and the lies are, this is just mine, it's unique, it's my family background, it's the way I'm wired, I can't help myself. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Not true. There is faithfulness that can allow you to break free from that. It gets even better. When you take the bite of your chocolate, and in your mind, I want you to think what it is because I think I left out the prescription drug people and the second, third, and fourth glass of wine people. You're just a functioning alcoholic. And people have talked to you about it. And by the way, my prayer before we started, for me and for you, Almighty God, Holy Spirit, will you peel back the layers of denial? Would you cause us to see ourselves for who we really are instead of all the excuses and all the denial and all the ways that we've somehow been able to live these lives of duplicity. Because if you don't get real and if you don't own it, if you don't say, that's my chocolate, that's my besetting sin, that's my struggle, and there's a way out, then you don't change. And, and, and then you receive the consequences of your behavior and it breaks your heavenly father's heart. But even when you blow it, when you sin, here's God's faithfulness. If you confess your sin, 1 John 1, 9, he is, are you ready? Here's our word, faithful and just to forgive you your sin and not just that, but to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. See, once you take the chocolate and you've logged on one more time and you've spent money that you don't have and you took the vacation because it made you feel better and then, ah, when you've posed and gossiped about someone else because somehow saying untrue things or shaded things about someone else puts them down and makes you feel better out of the envy in your heart. We all do these things. Then you feel such shame, especially if it comes to light. And he says, I'm faithful. I'll help you in your weakness. I'll help you when you're tempted. When you are biting the chocolate like this, if you'll come clean and say, oh God, I agree with you. That's what the word confess means. I agree with you. This is wrong. Would you forgive me? Jesus said, well, that's why I died. And I want to forgive you, and I want to cleanse you, and I want to put you on a new path. In fact, it gets so radical. This is a God that I don't think most Christians know. I think most Christians are living with sort of a, a healthy dose of sin management. You know, I don't think I'm sinning quite about as much as other people, and I'm doing this, and I'm doing this. And of course, the scripture says this, and I know it's a violation, but everyone else is doing it. And I think if I only do it at these times in these certain ways, and you live with this God consciousness over here, and this blatant things that you know are wrong over here, and it's just duplicity. And it tears at your soul, and it embarrasses the reputation of God. But even if you go beyond weakness and temptation and sin to, I mean, just failure, like I'm done. Notice what the scripture says about this wonderful, great God, because we will arrive when we see Jesus face to face, just like you. Second Timothy chapter two says, it is a trustworthy statement that if we died with him, we'll also live with him. If we endure, we'll also reign with him. If we deny him, he'll deny us. Did you get the parallelism? We've died with Christ and like in belief and baptism, we're going to live with him. We endure I mean, we're gonna, we're gonna, even if we're persecuted, we're going to reign. There's a reward. If we deny him by our behavior, by our actions, he'll deny us. You know, when you're not walking with God, he doesn't give you peace. His blessing is not on your life. He, he keeps wooing you, but if, if we deny him, he'll deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. I mean, you would think it's do, 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 should be, and no, 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 no. When you're faithless, I mean, I mean, when your whole spiritual engine breaks down and you've messed up beyond just sin, you, you are running away from God and you think there's no hope. You're in a black hole and you think God could never, ever, ever. And part of you, your heart's getting so hard, you don't even care and you're running away. When you're faithless, are you ready for this? He remains faithful. Why? Because he can't deny himself. It's his character. Even when you're faithless, I'm faithful because I cannot deny myself. Wouldn't you like to go through life with a friend like that? Wouldn't you want to go through life with someone that when you're tempted and when you're weak and when you sin and when you just fail, that would say, come unto me. Let me love you. Let me restore you. 
I'd like you to think about what you're gonna do with your life as we close this series. I'd like you to really think about what it is gonna look like for you to say to God, I'm gonna own my stuff, no more double life. It's gonna be a little bit scary, but I'm gonna, I am going to pursue making Christ and knowing him the number one priority in family and work and hobbies and money and plans will revolve around I want to do life the way that would honor and please you. And all I can tell you is, it's the life that's truly life.